Hello there, I'm Sandy Ulnock and I am an artist. I work in a lot of different mediums and I love to help you learn as well. Today I'm going to be doing a real-time gouache painting, which means that since there's a lot of stuff that I'm just going to be moving back and forth with the brush, I'm going to just put some music on in those portions and then I'll come back whenever there's something that I want to explain. But I hope you'll find this enjoyable and educational and maybe even a little bit relaxing. All right, let's get to it. To begin with, let's look at the photo. And this is from Horseshoe Waterfall in Tasmania. Beautiful picture. I chose it because it has really nice contrast and I wanted something white in it so we could talk a little bit more about leaving the white. This is the palette I'll be using. If you want to see more about the palette, you can look at my last video. As it's going to be off camera here so that I can keep the painting itself and the white tile, which is where I'll be doing my mixing, visible for you so you can see what I'm doing. And I am just sketching the biggest shapes, the shapes of the waterfall and the water and that kind of, I guess it's a rock wall that the waterfall is coming down on. Just sketching the biggest parts of it and letting the rest go because I'm going to paint all that in. And when you start covering all the pencil with wash, you kind of lose all that detail anyway, so you might as well not spend your time worrying on it. So I've taken a green and a brown, and you can do this with any kinds of colors that are kind of opposite on the color wheel because burnt sienna is on the opposite side of the color wheel as uh, greens because it's more of an orangey red kind of color. And then I'm going to add in some Hansa Yellow Deep to make some greens that are a little more on the olive side just so I have some variation. I'm not going to be stressing out and we're trying to match all the hues in the photograph itself. That would take hours to do because wash is taking me a long time. So I decided this is just going to be a quick painting. And when I say quick, I mean like it's not going to be five hours. We're just going to get her done. And I'm putting down a basic watercolor wash using gouache because gouache is just opaque watercolor. You can use it as regular watercolor. It just is going to have a little more of, I guess, that chalky feel that you get from some of those cheap watercolors, which makes me wonder what's in the cheap watercolors that I've used in the past, because it, it just has more of that gouache feel, so it doesn't have quite the life and transparency that I'm used to in watercolor, but you can use it very thin like this, and it'll have all the same movement on the watercolor paper. This is hot press paper, and I have never had luck having any kind of smooth backgrounds on hot press paper. But since I'm going to be putting all these plants on it, I don't really care if my background is messy at this point. But I am using a regular watercolor brush for that portion because I'm trying to do a watercolory type of thing. And right now I don't have any nice big brushes that are synthetics like this Blickmaster synthetic round that I'm going to be using for a lot of the painting. The synthetic brushes that don't hold water are the kind that work really well when you're trying to use the gouache opaquely. And when I was starting out at the beginning of January, because I did a whole month of gouache paintings, I was using my good brushes and they're my brushes that hold a lot of water and a lot of pigment and they expel it beautifully. I love so many things about them and it, they're pretty much really hard to work with in gouache because they make me just keep picking up more water. I have to stop rinsing my brush so much. And I do find now that I'm dipping a dirty brush into a well of paint in that, that palette that I'm using. And I'm not keeping much paint in there so that regularly I can replace it. Keeping just a little bit in the bottom and I'm not going hog wild with it so I don't mess up a whole bunch of paint but I'm trying to use only colors when I, I dip in like that and try not to drag too much water with me. I'm trying to use colors that I would normally mix with that anyway. So if I'm using a, a green color and I have some yellow on my brush, 
it's going to be okay if I have a little more yellow with it because I might mix it with some yellow at some point anyway. And then eventually I get to just replace it. There's plenty of professional gouache artists who don't use a palette like I'm using, and I'm just using it because I'm new and I don't know how much paint to squeeze out onto a mixing palette. I have no idea. But there's plenty of people who just do that. They put out a dollop of whatever colors they're going to use for that particular painting and they're done with it. They, they don't need to dip back into a palette. But for now, I'm going to wear my training wheels and just do it that way. So I'm putting in my darks here. I'm just looking at the photograph and, you know, doing a little squinting and trying to put some blocks of dark paint where I see the darks in the photo. And again, I'm not trying to replicate every single little bush. I'm just trying to get the general feel for where the darks are and where the lights are. And I'm using a mixture of greens and then throwing in some burnt sienna and darker colors. And when you mix those together, then you can get another alternate color so that you're underlaying dark colors that we're going to paint on top of have a different flavor as they move across. So in the area that's got a lot of rock in it, I'm assuming that's what's under all of the shadow. I can put some browns in there. If you have some grays, you know, that kind of thing, you can put that in there. I try not to use black any more than necessary because wash paintings are flat anyway. They're matte. They're not shiny. And so you don't get the bang for your buck with black that you get when you mix other colors. So you can see the color that I've got here I'm mixing is practically black. It's just not black. I've got some, I think at this point I have some ultramarine blue in this mix. And these three colors do make kind of a blackish color. And that's one of the things I'm keeping the palette for is so I can have all these colors to just try out and see okay, what do these two do together? Can I make a really dark color out of that? Or can I make a gray using these three colors? You know, if, if I'm gonna need a gray in a painting, I try to use colors throughout the painting that are going to have that color in them. I, I don't wanna just suddenly switch over and use black and white for something. So if I wanted to put some gray in the water, I would want to mix it out of the colors that are already in the surrounding and not just throw something in for one little one little thing. I mean, unless it's a paint can, if it's a, you know, something artificial in there. But if it's Mother Nature, I try to keep the colorway pretty simple. So as I keep painting this, I'm going to dip in and out with giving you some narration and also some music. So. In a little bit if I disappear for just a few minutes I will be back so I'm gonna keep on painting the darks for the moment So now it's time to grab some titanium white and start getting some lighter colors. 
You can also lighten with other things. If you're using colors that would work well with a buff titanium, then you could jump in with, with that kind of a color as your lightener. And here, one of the things that surprised me was when I mixed that mixture I had down there that was kind of, remember I said it was black-ish? It went very gray. It's like a green-gray color, which is not the color I actually see. There's some warmth in there, so I will be adding some warmth to it later to try to mimic that a little bit more. But that made it more clear to me that I had gotten pretty close to black because as soon as I mixed it with white, I ended up with that grayish kind of color. I'm mixing around the puddles of paint. You'll see me do that throughout. So I start off with adding some white in one section, but I leave another section of the paint a darker color so that I can go back and forth if I see something is too light, if the value of it is too bright. Then I can jump over to a little bit of darker pigment, just a you know quarter of an inch over from where I picked up pigment the last time and start to get some transition in color. With wash, I found that I'm paying far more attention to value than I ever have before. And it's not that I didn't paint with value, but it was more that I was able to keep on adding richer darks as I went or glazing over something to change the value. With gouache, like you have to nail the value. If you suddenly have a very bright white rock, it's gonna stand out like a sore thumb. So here's where I start adding in some more of the burnt sienna because I knew I needed to make more of those rocks warm because they're clearly not gray rocks in the picture. So I'm you know, gonna mix a whole bunch of different browns that I can start throwing in here, here and there. At a point like this, I'm not actually looking at the photograph trying to figure out where every rock is. I'm just trying to get the overall sense of the, the flavor of where I'm headed as opposed to getting real specific. Because again, we're not spending five hours on this. I'll try to just do this as a quick demonstration so you can see what you can accomplish with gouache. So I'm gonna continue adding some of the lights and the midtones, just going back and forth between the colors, picking up some of the dark, picking up some of the light. And my palette just gets to be a giant mess of swirling puddles by the end. I don't know if everybody else's does, but that's what mine does. So I'm just going to keep adding a few bits here and there. One of my reasons for adding blue in there when I was mixing my darks is so that I'd be able to add some blue in the water. Now I could have gone back to that grayish kind of color, that green gray. I wanted to see what I could do with just a little bit of blue in there and add in other colors as well, but just some very pale, pale blue that just makes it feel more like a waterfall. Doing that with super light layers. And since the paper is white, it's not paper that has got another color under it, I can use very watery pigment in here. I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to pick up color from underneath. If I had painted right through all of that and just put the rocks in underneath and counted on adding the, the waterfall on top of it, then I'd have to really struggle with a lot of white 
paint and trying to mix it so it's absolutely perfect and doesn't pick up all that color underneath. And I'm not at that point yet where I can mix perfectly. I can't trust myself to do that. So that is one reason why I encourage just leave the white. Just let the paper be white where it needs to be white and save yourself a lot of agony later on, for sure. It's not that you can't add the white, but it's just tougher. I'm I'm all for easy right now in trying to, to learn some of the, I guess, shortcuts that I'm going to need in order to survive this journey, because I think it's going to be a long one for me trying to figure out gouache. In each one of these passes, I'm adding in different types of greens then and just moving lighter and lighter little by little. And sometimes I start off with a green and I think, yeah, okay, that's going to be a good mid-tone. As soon as I get it down on the paper, I realize I need another transition color. With gouache, I haven't figured out yet if it's possible to get some kind of a smooth blend. And so far that's not been my my success place, what I've found is I feel a little bit more like an oil painter. I'm adding like a little of this color and then a little slightly lighter and then slightly lighter and just letting different brush strokes slowly get lighter as it moves higher toward the light, whatever the object is that I'm using. So I'm finding that just trying to blend which I'm used to with all my transparent mediums, is just where I have to force my head not to think about that. I have to look at where my dark is and what is the next lightest that I need to use. And you can go back in with dark on top. Absolutely, you can work that direction. There are some photographs you'll find where going from light in the background to dark in the foreground is exactly what you need to do. But with a lot of the photographs I've been working with, I... I have not found very many, at least at this point, that are like that, except for like a vista of a sky and mountains, and then you've got whatever trees that are in front of that. But there's things like this where I am going to start painting from the back, because if there's anything along that hillside where the waterfall is coming down from, if there's any of that that's in front of the things in the back, it needs to be able to be painted in front of them. So I'm focusing some of my energies back there, but I'm not really unable to fix things that go on back there later if I need to. But you can go back and forth and add darks back in. I've ended up painting out whole sections all over again to try to create something where, you know, a section that didn't work, I'm just trying to cover over it, it's just really hard to match color exactly. On something like this that has a gajillion greens, you're kind of safe to be able to do that. As I'm watching myself paint this with the photograph right here beside it, this close, I'm realizing how far off I was in color. I really didn't do a good job of mixing more of those olive green kinds of colors. But as I said, I wasn't stressed out about trying to be super accurate. I was just trying to Get a painting done that I could put out here that would be kind of a quick type of painting, a little longer than what I did in my previous demonstration, but showing how at least the process that I've developed so far works in context of a landscape and trying to build up trees and rocks and that sort of thing. So forgive my, my colors here because they're not exactly as accurate as I would like them to be. If you go back and look at my last video, you'll see the kinds of paintings that I did that took me five hours. And also while I'm talking about this, let me mention that if you're still watching this on the day it goes live, until tomorrow night, February 5th, 2023, the auction is still going. So I'm doing a charity auction to raise money for my favorite charity, which is World Central Kitchen. 
and the 31 paintings that I did in January, in addition to this painting, are all available for you to bid on. So you can look at the link in the doobly-doo after you're done watching this and go bid on something you have until Sunday evening, February 5th, in order to get your bids all in. And it ends at 11.59.59 in Pacific time, since that's where I live. So now I'm starting to consider bringing in some of the real bright colors. And that means starting to, to pull some of these elements forward. I decided to even put more brights on that little chunk of vines that are hanging down that I'm working on right now. Just because it felt like I needed something happy in there. Since I had some other happy color around it, I wanted something to start cascading down beside the waterfall. And I'm using some spring green for that happy color and then mixing it with whatever is in my palette. So when you see a, a name of a color pop up on the screen, it doesn't necessarily mean use that color purely because palette is just a mix mesh. It's in you know, pile of different colors blending together. But that does help the whole thing to start to feel unified. Although sometimes it can make it feel like everything is the same color. And that's a little bit of what I'm feeling as I'm looking at myself paint this and thinking, Sandy, you should have done this, you should have done that. Because I am ever the critic of trying, trying to get myself to think through things better. But I'm glad I was just moving forward with doing it instead of talking myself out of publishing a video with a, a full painting in it because of, you know, well, gee whiz, I can't do that in less than five hours. So I'm happy that I actually just did it. Kind of sometimes when you're trying something new, it's difficult to share that with anybody and let them see that you're having some struggles, that things are not working the way you may have wanted them to. So for me, that's just a big hurdle to overcome. So now I've got some of the larger plants that are cascading in from the side. And that's where things start to get fun because now all those smaller details are coming into play. As I looked at this photo on my iPad that was up at the top of my desk, I was trying to squint and see what is that thing? There's something hanging down. Don't know if that's another cascade of water or if that's just a tree branch, exactly what that is. But I was trying not to think too much about what it is. And that's just something as a person whose eyesight is slowly failing. I'm gonna need cataract surgery at some point. Uh, I get used to just squinting at things and saying, okay, I don't care what that is. I don't care if it's a tree or a bush or a cloud. What is the color and the shape and the value of it? I can't determine any details enough to see what it is. Can I mimic something that's in there? And that's where I decided to go with that part. It's just, I'm going to guess that it's maybe a tree branch back there. As I started painting that fern or whatever it is, I started realizing that it needed more dark at the base. So as I said, you can keep adding more darks in here as well, but when you add a dark, 
if you've got really nice thick paint, then it's going to look really clunky on the front, front of the painting in many instances. Not in all, but it isn't going to sink back in. So then I take my brush and I go back and work into it to try to soften that edge and help it to not look like a big old splooge of paint. And if it starts to get too wet at any point, you can just use a heat gun or a hair dryer to dry it. It's not going to hurt the painting at all. There's moss all over a lot of these rocks as well. So now that I've got the base of the brown and the gray in the rocks themselves, I can add the moss up on top. I'm adding it here and there in various places. I'm not looking at the photo to try to replicate that exactly. Just putting it over the rocks that I've already got in place. And it just starts to bring things to life because now it's not got just all those neutrals, but it has chunks of green here and there. Depending on the size that you're painting this, you could get into a whole lot of detail or you can just keep it kind of loose, which is what I decided I was going to try to do here and not overdo it. As the paint dries, it can change and get a little bit darker. It's the opposite of watercolor, which just keeps getting lighter and lighter. And you realize you should have put down darker color in the first place. And with gouache, I find that I'm always trying to go back in and find another place where I can drop a little light in. Sometimes my lights are an actual white pigment, but usually I just take a very, very pale version of something else in the palette in order to add some white to it. I don't like to add just pure white unless it is something that is white white. And that, that waterfall has some bits in it that are very white white. So I could do it there, but anything in this picture aside from the water, I would use a very pale green or something in order to make some highlights on something. Maybe a yellow uh, depending on what kind of color you're looking for. But well, speaking of white, um, I'm also, when I, I try to make something that's going to actually be white, I try to take from the tube if I can, if it needs to be super white and the pigment needs to be nice and thick. Because if I use the paint that's in the palette, Sometimes that's just going to get too squishy and not move very well. To paint that stick that was trailing down from that upper left side, I actually used some very thin white pigment. That's the like, kind of watercolor-ish pigment so that it would pick up some of the color underneath of it. Sometimes you can use that to your benefit. And I am going to call this painting done before I start to even overwork it and go into far too much detail. So there is my finished version. And as I said before, you can head over to the charity auction if you're interested in this or any of my other pieces. Please bid generously. We'd like to raise some good money for World Central Kitchen. Thank you so much for joining me for this video. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, click the like button. And make sure you're subscribed so you see my next video coming up. If you have further questions about gouache, please do leave them in the comments down below. I would be more than happy to research those things if I don't already know the answer. And I will be doing more gouache videos in the future. Alrighty, I will see you next time. Take care 
Go create something every day.